Book Three, Part One of the Aeneid. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Three, Sea Wanderings and Strange Meetings, Part One. When heaven had overturned the Trojan state and Priam's throne by too severe a fate, when ruined Troy became the Grecians' prey and Ilium's lofty towers in ashes lay. Warned by celestial omens, we retreat to seek in foreign lands a happier seat. Near old Antandros and at Ida's foot, the timber for the sacred groves we cut and build our fleet, uncertain yet to find what place the gods for our repose assigned. Friends daily flock and scarce the kindly spring began to clothe the ground and birds to sing. When old Anchises summoned all to see, the crew, my father, and the fates obey. With sighs and tears I leave my native shore, and empty fields where Ilium stood before. My sire, my son, our less and greater gods, all sail at once and cleave the briny floods. Against our coast appears a spacious land, which once the fierce Lycurgus did command. Trachia, the name, the people bold in war, vast are their fields, and tillage is their care. A hospital realm, while fate was kind, with Troy in friendship and religion joined. I land with luckless omens, then adore their gods, and draw a line along the shore. I lay the deep foundations of a wall, and Aenos named from me the city call. To Dionian Venus vows are paid, and all the powers that rising labors aid, a bull on Jove's imperial altar laid. Not far a rising hillock stood in view, sharp mittels on the sides and cornels grew. There, while I went to crop the sylvan scenes, and shade our altar with their leafy greens, I pulled a plant with horror I relate. A prodigy so strange and full of fate, the rooted fibres rose, and from the wound black bloody drops distilled upon the ground. Mute and amazed my hair with terror stood, fear shrunk my sinews and congealed my blood. Man once again, another plant I try, that other gushed with the same sanguine dye. Then, fear and guilt for some offence unknown, with prayers and vows the dryads I atone. With all the sisters of the woods and most, the god of arms who rules the Trachian coast, that they or he these omens would avert, release our fears and better signs impart. Cleared as I thought, and fully fixed at length, to learn the cause I tugged with all my strength, I bent my knees against the ground once more, the violated myrtle ran with gore. Scarce dare I tell the sequel from the womb of wounded earth and caverns of the tomb, a groan as of a troubled ghost renewed. My fright, and then these dreadful words ensued. Why dost thou thus my buried body rend? O oh, spare the corpse of thy unhappy friend! Spare to pollute thy pious hands with blood! The tears distilled not from the wounded wood, but every drop this living tree contains is kindred blood and ran in Trojan veins. O oh, fly from this unhospitable shore, warned by my fate, for I am Polydor. Here loads of lances in my blood embrued, again shot upward by my blood renewed. My faltering tongue and shivering limbs declare my horror and in bristles rose my hair when troy with grecian arms was closely pent old priam fearful of the war's event this hapless polydor to trachia sent loaded with gold he sent his darling far from noise and tumults and destructive war committed to the faithless tyrant's care who when he saw the power of troy decline forsook the weaker with the strong to join broke every bond of nature and of truth, and murdered for his wealth the royal youth. O sacred hunger of pernicious gold, 
What bands of faith can impious lucre hold? Now, when my soul had shaken off her fears, I call my father and the Trojan peers. Relate the prodigies of heaven require, what he commands and their advice desire. All vote to leave that execrable shore, polluted with the blood of Polydor. But ere we sail, his funeral rites prepare, then to his ghost a tomb and altars rear. In mournful pomp the matrons walk the round, with baleful cypress and blue fillets crowned, with eyes dejected and with hair unbound. The bowels of tepid milk and blood we pour, and thrice invoke, the soul of Polydor. Now, when the rage in storms no longer reign, but southern gales invite us to the main, we launch our vessels with a prosperous wind, and leave the cities and the shores behind. An island in the Aegean main appears, Neptune and the watery Doris claim it theirs. It floated once till Phoebus fixed the sides, to rooted earth, and now it braves the tides. Here borne by friendly winds we come ashore, with needful ease our weary limbs restore, and the sun's temple and his town adore. Anius, the priest and king, with laureled crowned, his hoary locks with purple fillets bound, who saw my sire the Delian shore ascend, came forth with eager haste to meet his friend invites him to his palace, and in sign of ancient love their plighted hands they join. Then to the temple of the god I went, and thus before the shrine my vows present. Give, O Tymbrius, give a resting place to the sad relics of the Trojan race, a seat secure, a region of their own, a lasting empire, and a happier town. Where shall we fix? Where shall our labors end? Whom shall we follow, and what fate attend? Let not my prayer's doubtful answer find, but in clear auguries unveil thy mind. Scarce had I said he shook the holy ground, the laurels and the lofty hills around, and from the tree post rushed a bellowing sound, prostrate we fell, confessed the present God, who gave this answer from his dark abode. Undaunted youth, go seek that mother earth, from which your ancestors derive their birth, the soil that sent you forth, her ancient race, in her old bosom shall again embrace. Through the wide world the Aeneian house shall reign, and children's children shall the crown sustain. Thus Phoebus did our future fates disclose, A mighty tumult mixed with joy arose. All are concerned to know what place the god Assigned and where determined our abode. My father, long revolving in his mind The race and lineage of the Trojan kind, Thus answered their demands, Ye princes, hear your pleasing fortune And dispel your fear. The fruitful isle of Crete, well known to fame, sacred of old to Jove's imperial name, in the mid-ocean lies with large command, and on its plains a hundred cities stand. Another Ida rises there, and we from thence derive our Trojan ancestry. From thence, as is divulged by certain fame, to the Ruetan shores old Tevcrus came. There fixed and there the seat of empire chose, ere Ilium and the Trojan towers arose. In humble vales they built their soft abodes, till Cybele, the mother of the gods, with tinkling cymbals charmed the Idean woods, the secret rites and ceremonies taught, and to the joke the savage lions brought. Let us the land which heaven appoints explore, appease the winds and seek the Gnossian shore. If Jove assist the passage of our fleet, the third propitious dawn discovers Crete. Thus having said, the sacrifices laid on smoking altars to the gods he paid. A bull to Neptune, an oblation due, another bull to bright Apollo slew, a milk-white eve, 
the western winds to please, and one coal black to calm the stormy seas. Ere this a flying rumour had been spread, that fierce Idomeneus from Crete was fled, expelled and exiled, that the coast was free from foreign or domestic enemy. We leave the Delian ports and put to sea, by Naxos famed for vintage make our way. Then green Donysa pass, and sail in sight of Paros isle with marble quarries white. We pass the scattered isles of Cyclades, that scarce distinguished seem to stud the seas. The shouts of sailors double near the shores, they stretch their canvas, and they ply their oars. All hands aloft, for Crete, for Crete, they cry, and swiftly through the foamy billows fly. Full on the promised land at length we bore, with joy descending on the Cretan shore. With eager haste a rising town I frame, which from the Trojan Pergamus I name. The name itself was grateful, I exhort, to found their houses and erect a fort. Our ships are hauled upon the yellow strand, the youth begin to till the laboured land, and I myself new marriages promote. Give laws and dwellings I divide by lot. When rising vapours choke the wholesome air, And blasts of noisome winds corrupt the air, The trees devouring caterpillars burn, Parched was the grass, and blighted was the corn. Nor scape the beast, for Sirius from on high, With pestilential heat infects the sky. My men, some fall, the rest in fevers fry. Again my father bids me seek the shore Of sacred Delos and the god implore, To learn what end of woes we might expect, And to what clime our weary course direct. T'was night when every creature void of cares The common gift of balmy slumber shares. The statues of my gods, for such they seemed, Those gods whom I from flaming Troy redeemed. Before me stood, majestically bright, full in the beams of Phoebus' entering light. Then thus they spoke, and eased my troubled mind. What from the Delian god thou goest to find, he tells thee here, and sends us to relate. Those powers are we, companions of thy fate, who from the burning town by thee were brought. Thy fortune followed, and thy safety wrought. Through seas and lands, as we thy steps attend, so shall our care thy glorious race befriend. An ample realm for thee thy fates ordain, a town that o'er the conquered world shall reign. Thou mighty walls for mighty nations build, nor let thy weary mind to labors yield. But change thy seat, for not the Delian god, nor we have given thee Crete for our abode. A land there is, Hesperia called of old. The soil is fruitful, and the natives bold. The Oenotrans held it once, by later fame, now called Italia from the leader's name. Lasius there and Dardanus were born. From thence we came, and thither must return. Rise, and thy sire with these glad tidings greet. Search Italy, for Jove denies thee Crete. Astonished at their voices and their sight, nor were they dreams but visions of the night, I saw, I knew their faces, and described, in perfect view, their hair with fillets tied. I started from my couch, a clammy sweet, on all my limbs and shivering body sate. To heaven I lift my hands with pious haste, and sacred incense in the flames I cast. Thus to the gods their perfect honours done. More cheerful to my good old sire I run, and tell the pleasing news. In little space he found his error of the double race. Not as before he deemed derived from Crete, no more deluded by the doubtful seat, then said, O son, turmoiled in Trojan fate, such things as these Cassandra did relate. This day revives within my mind what she foretold of Troy renewed in Italy. 
the Latian lands, but who could then have thought that Phrygian gods to Latium should be brought, or who believed what mad Cassandra taught? Now let us go where Phoebus leads the way. He said, and we with glad consent obey. Forsake the seat, and leaving few behind, we spread our sails before the willing wind. Now from the sight of land our galleys move, with only seas around and skies above. When over our heads descends a burst of rain, and night with sable clouds involves the main. The ruffling winds, the foamy billows raise, the scattered fleet is forced to several ways. The face of heaven is ravished from our eyes, and in redoubled peals the roaring thunder flies. Cast from our course, we wander in the dark, no stars to guide, no point of land to mark. Even Palinurus no distinction found, betwixt the night and day such darkness reigned around. Three starless nights the doubtful navy strays, without distinction, and three sunless days. The fourth renews the light, and from our shrouds we view a rising land like distant clouds. The mountain tops confirm the pleasing sight, and curling smoke ascending from their height. The canvas falls, their oars the sailors ply. From the rude strokes the whirling waters fly. At length I land upon the Strophades, safe from the dangers of the stormy seas. Those isles are compassed by the Union main, the dire abode by the foul Harpius reign. Forced by the winged warriors to repair to their old homes and leave their costly fare, monsters more fierce offended heaven never sent from hell's abyss for human punishment. With virgin faces, but with wombs obscene, foul paunches and with ordure still unclean, with claws for hands and looks for ever lean. We landed at the port and soon beheld fat herds of oxen graze the flowery field, and wanton goats without a keeper strayed. With weapons we the welcome prey invade. Then call the gods for partners of our feast, and Jove himself the chief invited guest. We spread the tables on the greensward ground, we fed with hunger and the bowls go round, when from the mountain tops with hideous cry and clattering wings the hungry harpies fly. They snatch the meat, defiling all they find, and parting leave a loathsome stench behind. Close by a hollow rock again we sit, new dress the dinner, and the beds refit, secure from sight beneath a pleasing shade, where tufted trees a native arbor made. Again the holy fires on altars burn, and once again the ravenous birds return, or from the dark recesses where they lie, or from another quarter of the sky. With filthy claws their odious meal repeat, and mix their loathsome ordures with their meat. I bid my friends for vengeance then prepare, and with the hellish nation wage the war. They as commanded for the fight provide, and in the grass their glittering weapons hide. Then, when along the crooked shore we hear their clattering wings and saw the foes appear, Messenus sounds a charge, we take the alarm, and our strong hands with swords and bucklers arm. In this new kind of combat all employ their utmost force, the monsters to destroy. In vain the fated skin is proof to wounds, and from their plumes the shining sword rebounds. At length rebuffed they leave their mangled prey, and their stretched pinions to the skies display. Yet one remained the messenger of fate, high on a craggy cliff Celano sate, and thus her dismal errand did relate. What, not contended with our oxen slain? Dare you with heaven an impious war maintain, and drive the harpies from their native reign? Heed therefore what I say, and keep in mind what Joe decrees, what Phoebus has designed. And I, the Furious Queen, from both relate, 
You seek the Italian shores, foredoomed by fate. The Italian shores are granted you to find, and a safe passage to the port assigned. But know that ere your promised walls you build, my curses shall severely be fulfilled. Fierce famine is your lot for this misdeed, reduced to grin the plates on which you feed. She said, and to the neighboring forest flew, Our courage fails us, and our fears renew. Hopeless to win by war, to prayers we fall, And on the offended harpies humbly call. And whether gods or birds obscene they were, Our vows for pardon and for peace prefer. But old Anchises offering sacrifice, and lifting up to heaven his hands and eyes, adored the greater gods. Avert, said he, these omens render vain this prophecy, and from the impending curse a pious people free. Thus having said, he bids us put to sea, we loose from shore our halsers and obey, and soon with swelling sails pursue the watery way, amidst our course Sacynthian woods appear, and next by rocky Neritos we steer. We fly from Ithaca's detested shore, and curse the land which dire Ulysses bore. At length Levcata's cloudy top appears, and the sun's temple which the sailor fears. Resolved to breathe a while from labor past, our crooked anchors from the prow we cast, and joyful to the little city haste, here, safe beyond our hopes, our vows we pay, to Joe, the guide and patron of our way. The customs of our country we pursue, and Trojan games on Axian shores renew. Our youth their naked limbs besmear with oil, and exercise the rustler's noble toil. Pleased to have sailed so long before the wind, and left so many Grecian towns behind. The sun had now fulfilled his annual course, and Boreas on the seas displayed his force. I fixed upon the temple's lofty door the brazen shield which vanquished Abbas bore. The verse beneath my name and action speaks, These arms Aeneas took from conquering Greeks. Then I command to weigh the seamen ply, their sweeping oars, the smoking billows fly. The sight of high Phaeacia soon we lost, and skimmed along Epirus' rocky coast. Then to Caonia's port our course we bend, and, landed, to Botrotus' heights ascend. Here wondrous things were loudly blazed fame, how Helenus revived the Trojan name and reigned in grief that Priam's captive son succeeded Pyrrhus in his bed and throne, and fair Andromache restored by fate, once more was happy in a Trojan mate. I leave my galleys riding in the port, and long to see the new Dardanian court. By chance the mournful queen before the gate, then solemnized her former husband's fate, Green altars raised on turf, with gifts she crowned, And sacred priests in order stand around, And thrice the name of hapless Hector sound. The grove itself resembles Ida's wood, And Simois seemed the well-dissembled flood. But when at nearer distance she beheld My shining armor and my Trojan shield, Astonished at the sight, the vital heat Forsakes her limbs, her veins no longer beat. She faints, she falls, and scarce recovering strength. Thus, with a faltering tongue, she speaks at length. Are you alive, O goddess born? she said. Or if a ghost, then where is Hector's shade? At this she cast a loud and frightful cry. With broken words I made this brief reply. All of me that remains appears in sight. I live if living to be loath the light. No phantom, but I drag a wretched life, my fate resembling that of Hector's wife. What have you suffered since you lost your lord? 
by what strange blessing are you now restored? Still are you Hector's, or is Hector fled, and this remembrance lost in Pyrrhus' bed? With eyes dejected in a lowly tone, after the modest pause she is thus begun. O oh, only happy maid of Priam's race, whom death delivered from the foe's embrace, commanded on Achilles' tomb to die, not forced like us to hard captivity, or in a haughty master's arms to lie. In Grecian ships unhappy we were born, endure the victor's lust, sustain the scorn. Thus I submitted to the lawless pride of Pyrrhus, more a handmaid than a bride. Cloyed with possession, he forsook my bed, and Helen's lovely daughter sought to wed. Then me to Trojan Helenus resigned, and his two slaves in equal marriage joined. Till young Orestes pierced with deep despair, and longing to redeem the promised fair, before Apollo's altar slew the ravisher, by Pyrrhus' death the kingdom we regained, at least one half with Helenus remained. Our part from Caon he Caonia calls, and names from Pergamus his rising walls. But you, what fates have landed on our coast? What gods have sent you, or what storms have tossed? Does young Ascanius life and health enjoy, saved from the ruins of unhappy Troy? Oh, tell me how his mother's loss he bears, what hopes are promised from his blooming years, how much of Hector in his face appears. She spoke and mixed her speech with mournful cries, and fruitless tears came trickling from her eyes. At length her lord descends upon the plain, in pomp attended with a numerous train, receives his friends and to the city leads, and tears of joy amidst his welcome sheds, proceeding on another Troy I see, or in less compass Troy's epitome, a rivulet by the name of Xanthus ran, and I embrace the Scaean gate again. My friends in porticos were entertained, and feasts and pleasures through the city reigned. The tables filled the spacious hall around, and golden bowls with sparkling wine were crowned. Two days we passed in mirth till friendly gales, blown from the supplied our swelling sails. Then to the royal seer I thus began, O thou who knowest beyond the reach of man the laws of heaven and what the stars decree, whom Phoebus taught unerring prophecy, from his own tree-pod and his holy tree, skilled in the winged inhabitants of air, what our species their notes and flights declare. O oh, say, for all religious rites portend, a happy voyage and a prosperous end, and every power and omen of the sky direct my course for destined Italy. But only dire Selana from the gods a dismal famine fatally forebodes. O oh, say, what dangers I am first to shun, what toils vanquish and what course to run. The prophet first with sacrifice adores, the greater gods, their pardon then implores, unbinds the fillet from his holy head, to Phoebus next my trembling steps he led, full of religious doubts and awful dread, and then with his god possessed before the shrine, these words proceeded from his mouth divine. O God is born, for heaven's appointed will, with greater auspices of good than ill, foreshows thy voyage and thy course directs, thy fate conspire and Jove himself protects. Of many things some few I shall explain, teach thee to shun the dangers of the main, and how at length the promised shore to gain. The rest the fates from Helenus conceal, and Juno's angry power forbids to tell. First then that happy shore that seems so nigh, will far from you deluded wishes fly. 
Long tracts of seas divide your hopes from Italy, for you must cruise along Sicilian shores and stem the currents with your struggling oars. Then round the Italian coast your navy steer, and after this to Kirkus island wear. And last, before your new foundations rise, must pass the Stygian lake and view the nether skies. Now mark the signs of future ease and rest, and bear them safely treasured in thy breast. When, in the shady shelter of a wood, and near the margin of a gentle flood, Thou shalt behold a sow upon the ground, with thirty sucking young encompassed round, the dam and offspring white as falling snow, these on thy city shall their name bestow, and there shall end thy labours and thy woe, nor let the threatened famine fright thy mind, for Phoebus will assist, and fate the way will find. Let not thy course to that ill coast be bent, which fronts from far the Epirian continent. Those parts are all by Grecian foes possessed, the salvage Locrians here the shores infest, the fierce Idomenus his city builds, and guards with arms the Salentinian fields, and on the mountain's brow Betilia stands, which Philoketus with his troops commands, even when thy fleet is landed on the shore, and priests with holy vows the gods adore, then with a purple veil involve your eyes, lest hostile faces blast the sacrifice. These rites and customs to the rest commend, that to your pious race they may descend. End of Book 3, Part 1 of the Aeneid Book Three, Part Two of the Aeneid. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Three. Sea Wanderings and Strange Meetings, Part Two. When parted hence, the wind that ready waits for Sicily shall bear you to the straits, where proud Pelorus opes a wider way tack to the larboard, and stand off to sea. Veer starboard sea and land, the Italian shore, and far Sicilia's coast were one before. An earthquake caused the flow, the roaring tides, the passage broke that land from land divides, and where the lands retired, the rushing ocean rides, distinguished by the straits on either hand, now rising cities in long order stand. And fruitful fields, so much can time invade, the moulding work that beauteous nature made. Far on the right, her dog's foul scylla hides, Charybdis roaring on the left presides, and in her greedy whirlpool sucks the tides, then spouts them from below, with fury driven. The waves mount up and wash the face of heaven. But Scylla from her den, with open jaws, the sinking vessel in her eddy draws, then dashes on the rocks, and human face, a virgin bosom, hides her tail's disgrace. Her parts obscene below the waves descend, with dogs enclosed, and in a dolphin end. Tis safer then to bear aloof to sea, and coast Pacinus, though with more delay, than once to view mishappen Scylla near, and the loud yell of watery wolves to hear. Besides, if faith to Helenus be due, and if prophetic Phoebus tell me true, do not this precept of your friend forget, which therefore more than once I must repeat. Above the rest great Juno's name adore, pay vows to Juno, Juno's aid implore. Let gifts be to the mighty queen designed, and mollify with prayers her haughty mind. Thus, at the length, your passage shall be free, 
and you shall safe descend on Italy. Arrived at Cume, when you view the flood of black Avernus and the sounding wood, the mad prophetic Sibyl you shall find, dark in a cave and on a rock reclined. She sings the fates, and in her frantic fits, the notes and names inscribed to leaves commits. What she commits to leaves in order laid before the cavern's entrance are displayed. Unmoved they lie, but if a blast of wind without or vapors issue from behind, the leaves are borne aloft in liquid air, and she resumes no more her useful care, nor gathers from the rocks her scattered verse, nor sets in order what the winds disperse. Thus many not succeeding, most upbraid, the madness of the visionary maid, and with the loud curses leave the mystic shade. Think it not loss of time a while to stay, though thy companions chide thy long delay. Though summoned to the seas, though pleasing gales, invite thy course and stretch thy swelling sails, but beg the sacred priestess to relate with willing words and not to write thy fate. The fierce Italian people she will show and all thy wars, and all thy future woe. And what thou must avoid, and what must undergo, she shall direct thy course, instruct thy mind, and teach thee how the happy shores to find. This is what heaven allows me to relate. Now part in peace, pursue thy better fate, and raise by strength of arms the Trojan state. This, when the priest with friendly voice declared, he gave me license and rich gifts prepared. Bounteous of treasure, he supplied my want with heavy gold and polished elephant. Then Dodonean cauldrons put on board, and every ship with sums of silver stored. A trusty coat of mail to me he sent, thrice chained with gold, for use and ornament. The helm of Pyrrhus added to the rest, that flourished with the plume and waving crest. Nor was my sire forgotten, nor my friends, and large recruits he to my navy sends. Men, horses, captains, arms, and warlike stores, supplies new pilots and new sweeping oars. Meantime, my sire commands to hoist our sails, lest we should lose the first auspicious gales. The prophet blessed the parting crew, and last, with words like these, his ancient friend embraced. Old happy man, the care of gods above, whom heavenly Venus honored with her love, and twice preserved thy life when Troy was lost. Behold from far the wished Ausonian coast, their land, but take a larger compass round, for that before is all forbidden ground. The shore that Phoebus has designed for you, at farther distant lies, concealed from view. Go happy hence and seek your new abodes, blessed in a sun and favored by the gods. For I with useless words prolong your stay when southern gales have summoned you away. Nor less the queen our parting thence deplored, nor was less bounteous than her Trojan lord. A noble present to my son she brought, a robe with flowers on golden tissue wrought, a Phrygian vest and loads with gifts beside, of precious texture and of Asian pride. Accept, she said, these monuments of love, which in my youth with happier hands I vow. Regard these trifles for the giver's sake, tis the last present Hector's wife can make. Thou callst my lost Astyanax to mind, 
In thee his features and his form I find. His eyes so sparkled with a lively flame, Such were his motions, such was all his frame. And ah, had heaven so pleased, his years had been the same. With tears I took my last adieu and said, Your fortune, happy pair, already made, Leaves you no farther wish, my different state, Avoiding one incurs another fate. To you a quiet seat the gods allow, You have no shores to search, no seas to plow, Nor fields of flying Italy to chase, Deluding visions and a vain embrace. You see another Simois and enjoy The labor of your hands, another Troy, With better auspice than her ancient towers And less obnoxious to the Grecian powers. If ever the gods whom I with vows adore Conduct my steps to Tiber's happy shore, if ever I ascend the Latian throne, And build a city I may call my own, As both of us our birth from Troy derive, So let our kindred lines in concord live, And both in acts of equal friendship strive. Our fortunes, good or bad, shall be the same, The double Troy shall differ but in name that what we now begin may never end, but long to late posterity descend. Near the Ceraunian rocks our course we bore, the shortest passage to the Italian shore. Now had the sun withdrawn his radiant light, and hills were hid in dusky shades of night. We land, and on the bosom of the ground a safe retreat and a bare lodging found. Close by the shore we lay, the sailors keep their watches, and the rest securely sleep. The night proceeding on with silent pace, stood in her noon and viewed with equal face her steepy rise and her declining race. Then wakeful Palinurus rose to spy the face of heaven and the nocturnal sky, and listened every breath of air to try, observes the stars, and notes their sliding course, the Pleiads, Hyads, and their watery force. And both the bears is careful to behold, and bright Orion armed with burnished gold. Then, when he saw no threatening tempest nigh, but a sure promise of a settled sky. He gave the sign to weigh, we break our sleep, forsake the pleasing shore, and plow the deep. And now the rising morn, with rosy light, adorns the skies, and put the stars to flight. When we from far, like bluish mist, discree the hills and then the plains of Italy, Acatus first pronounced the joyful sound, Then Italy the cheerful crew rebound. My sire Anchises crowned a cup with wine, And offering thus implored the powers divine. Ye gods, presiding over lands and seas, And you who raging winds and waves appease, Breathe on our swelling sails a prosperous wind, And smooth our passage to the port a singed. The gentle gales their flagging force renew, And now the happy harbor is in view. Minerva's temple then salutes our sight, Placed as a landmark on the mountain's height. We furl our sails, and turn the prows to shore, The curling waters round the galleys roar. The land lies open to the raging east, then, bending like a bow, with rocks compressed, Shuts out the storms, the winds and waves complain, And vent their malice on the cliffs in vain. The port lies hid within on either side, Two towering rocks the narrow mouth divide. The temple which aloft we viewed before, 
to distance flies and seems to shun the shore. Scarce landed, the first omens I beheld were four white steeds that cropped the flowery field. War, war is threatened from this foreign ground, my father cried, where warlike steeds are found. Yet since reclaimed to cherish they submit, and bend to stubborn jokes, and champ the bit. Peace may succeed to war, our way we bend, to Pallas and the sacred hill ascend. There prostrate to the fierce Virago pray, whose temple was the landmark of our way. Each with a Phrygian mantle veiled his head, and all commands of Hellenus obeyed, and pious rites to Grecian Juno paid. These dues performed, we stretch our sails and stand to sea, forsaking that suspected land. From hence Tarentum's base appears in view, for Hercules renowned, if fame be true. Just opposite Lacinian Juno stands, Caulunian towers and Scylacian strands. For shipwrecks feared, Mount Etna's thence we spy, Known by the smoky flames which cloud the sky. Far off we hear the waves with surly sound Invade the rocks, the rocks their groans rebound. The billows break upon the sounding strand And roll the rising tide impure with sand. Then thus Anchises, inexperience old, Tis that Charybdis which the seer foretold, and those promised rocks bear off to sea. With haste the frighted mariners obey, first Palinurus to the larboard veered, then all the fleet by his example steered. To heaven aloft of ridgy waves we ride, then down to hell descend when they divide. And thrice our galleys knocked the stony ground, and thrice the hollow rocks returned the sound. And thrice we saw the stars that stood with dews around. The flagging winds forsook us with the sun. And wearied on Cyclopian shores we run. The port capacious and secure from wind Is to the foot of thundering Etna joined. By turns a pitchy cloud she rolls on high. By turns hot embers from her entrails fly and flakes of mounting flames that lick the sky, oft from her bowels massy rocks are thrown, and shivered by the force come piecemeal down. Oft liquid lakes of burning sulphur flow, fed from the fiery springs that boil below. Enceladus, they say, transfixed by Jove, with blasted limbs came tumbling from above. And where he fell, the avenging father drew This flaming hill, and on his body threw. As often as he turns his weary sides, He shakes the solid isle, and smoke the heavens hides. In shady woods we pass the tedious night, Where bellowing sounds and groans our souls affright, Of which no cause is offered to the sight. For not one star was kindled in the sky, Nor could the moon her borrowed light supply. For misty clouds involved the firmament, The stars were muffled, and the moon was pent. Scarce had the rising sun the day revealed, Scarce had his heat the pearly dews dispelled, When from the woods there bolts before our sight, Somewhat betwixt a mortal and a sprite, so thin, so ghastly meagre, and so wan, So bare of flesh he scarce resembled man. This thing, all tattered, seemed from far to implore Our pious aid, and pointed to the shore. We look behind, then view his shaggy beard, His clothes were tagged with thorns, and filth his limbs besmeared. The rest is mean, in habit and in face, appeared a Greek, and such indeed he was. He cast on us from far a frightful view, whom soon for Trojans and for foes he knew. 
stood still and paused, then all at once began to stretch his limbs and trembled as he ran. Soon as approached upon his knees he falls, and thus with tears and sighs for pity calls. Now, by the powers above and what we share, from nature's common gift this vital air. O oh, Trojans, take me hence, I beg no more, but bear me far from this unhappy shore. Tis true, I am a Greek, and father own, among your foes besieged the imperial town. For such demerits, if my death be due, no more for this abandoned life I sue. This only favor let my tears obtain to throw me headlong in the rapid main. Since nothing more than death my crime demands, I die content to die by human hands. He said, and on his knees my knees embraced. I bade him boldly tell his fortune past, his present state, his lineage, and his name the occasion of his fears, and whence he came. The good Anchises raised him with his hand, who thus encouraged answered our demand. From Ithaca, my native soil, I came, to Troy and Achaemenides my name. Me, my poor father, with Ulysses sent, oh, had I stayed with poverty content. But fearful for themselves, my countrymen left me forsaken in the Cyclops' den. The cave, though large, was dark, the dismal floor was paved with mangled limbs and putrid gore. Our monstrous host, of more than human size, erects his head and stares within the skies, bellowing his voice, and horrid is his you. Ye gods, remove this plague from mortal view. The joints of slaughtered wretches are his foot, and for his wine he quaffs the streaming blood. These eyes beheld, when with his spacious hand he seized two captives of our Grecian band. Stretched on his back he dashed against the stones their broken bodies and their crackling bones. With spouting blood the purple pavement swims, while the dire glutton grins the trembling limbs. Not unrevenged Ulysses bore their fate, nor thoughtless of his own unhappy state. For gorged with flesh and drunk with human wine, while fast asleep the giant lay supine, snoring aloud and belching from his maw his indigested foam and morsels raw. We pray, we cast the lots, and then surround the monstrous body stretched along the ground. Each, as he could approach him, lends a hand to bore his eyeball with a flaming brand. Beneath his frowning forehead lay his eye, for only one did the vast frame supply. But that a globe so large, his front it filled, like the sun's disk or like a Grecian shield. The stroke succeeds, and down the pupil bends, this vengeance followed for our slaughtered friends. But haste, unhappy wretches, haste to fly, your cables cut, and on your oars rely. Such and so vast as Polypheme appears, a hundred more this hated island bears. Like him in caves they shut their woolly sheep, like him their herds on tops of mountains keep, like him with mighty strides they stalk from steep to steep, and now three moons their sharpened horns renew, since thus in woods and wilds obscure from view I drag my loathsome days with mortal fright, and in deserted caverns lodge by night. Oft from the rocks a dreadful prospect see, of the huge Cyclops like a walking tree. From far I hear his thundering voice resound, and trampling feet that shake the solid ground. Cornels and salvage berries of the wood, and roots and herbs have been my meager food. 
while all around my longing eyes I cast, I saw your happy ships appear at last. On those I fixed my hopes, to these I run, tis all I ask, this cruel race to shun. What other death you please yourselves bestow? Scarce had he said, when on the mountain's brow we saw the giant shepherd stalk before his following flock and leading to the shore. A monstrous bulk, deformed, deprived of sight, his staff a trunk of pine, to guide his steps aright. His ponderous whistle from his neck descends, his woolly care their pensive lord attends. This only solace his hard fortune sends. Soon, as he reached the shore and touched the waves, from his bored eye the guttering blood he laves. He gnashed his teeth and groaned through seas he strides, and scarce the topmost billows touched his sides. Seized with a sudden fear, we run to sea, the cables cut and silent haste away. The well-deserving stranger entertain, then buckling to the work, our oars divide the main. The giant hearkened to the dashing sound, but when our vessels out of reach he found, he strided onward and in vain essayed the union deep and durst no farther wade. With that he roared aloud the dreadful cry, shakes earth and air and seas the billows flee before the bellowing noise to distant Italy. The neighing Etna trembling all around, the winding caverns echo to the sound. His brother Kyklops hear the yelling roar, and, rushing down the mountains, crowd the shore. We saw their stern, distorted looks from far, and one-eyed glance that vainly threatened war. A dreadful council, with their heads on high, the misty clouds about their foreheads fly, not yielding to the towering tree of Jove, our tallest cypress of Diana's grove. New pangs of mortal fear our minds assail, we tug at every oar and hoist up every sail, and take the advantage of the friendly gale. Forewarned by Helenus we strive to shun Charybdis gulf, nor dare to Scylla run. An equal fate on either side appears, we, Tacking to the left are free from fears, for from Pelorus point the north arose, and drew us back where swift Pantagas flows. His rocky mouth we pass and make our way by Tapsus and Megara's winding bay. This passage Achaemenides had shown, tracing the course which he before had run. Right over against Plemirium's watery strand, there lies an isle once called the Ortygian land. Alpheus, as old fame reports, has found from Greece a secret passage underground. By love to beauteous Aretusa led, and mingling here they rolled in the same sacred bed. As Helenus enjoined, we next adore Diana's name, protectress of the shore. With prosperous gales we pass the quiet sounds of still Elorus and his fruitful bounds. Then, doubling Cape Pacinus, we survey the rocky shore extended to the sea. The town of Camarine from far we see, a fenny lake undrained by fate's decree. In sight of the Geloan fields we pass, and the large walls where mighty Gela was. Then Agragas with lofty summits crowned, long for the race of warlike steeds renowned. We pass Silenus and the palmy land, and widely shun the Lilibian strand, unsafe for secret rocks and moving sand. At length on shore the weary fleet arrived, which Drepanum's unhappy port received. Here, after endless labors, often tossed by raging storms and driven on every coast, 
my dear, dear father, spent with age I lost. Ease of my cares and solace of my pain, saved through a thousand toils, but saved in vain. The prophet, whom my future woes revealed, yet this the greatest and the worst concealed. And dire Seleno, whose foreboding skill denounced all else, was silent of the ill. This my last labor was, some friendly god from thence conveyed us to our blessed abode. Thus to the listening queen, the royal guest, his wandering's course and all his toils expressed, and here, concluding, he retired to rest. End of Book Three of the Aeneid Book Four, Part One of the Aeneid This is a LibriVox recording. The Aeneid by Publius Vergilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book Four, The Passion of the Queen Part One But anxious cares already seized the queen. She fed within her veins a flame unseen. The hero's valour, acts, and birth inspire her soul with love and fan the secret fire. His words, his looks, imprinted in her heart, improve the passion and increase the smart. Now, when the purple morn had chased away the dewy shadows and restored the day, her sister first with early care she sought, and thus in mournful accents eased her thought. My dearest Anna, what new dreams affright my labouring soul! What visions of the night disturb my quiet and distract my breast with strange ideas of our Trojan guest! His worth, his actions, and majestic air a man descended from the gods declare. Fear ever argues a degenerate kind. His birth is well asserted by his mind. Then what he suffered when by fate betrayed! What brave attempts for falling Troy he made! Such were his looks, so gracefully he spoke, that were I not resolved against the yoke of hapless marriage, never to be cursed with second love, so fatal was my first, to this one error I might yield again. For since Sichaeus was untimely slain, this only man is able to subvert the fixed foundations of my stubborn heart, and to confess my frailty to my shame. Somewhat I find within, if not the same, too like the sparkles of my former flame. But first let yawning earth a passage rend, and let me through the dark abyss descend. First let avenging Jove with flames from high drive down this body to the nether sky, condemned with ghosts in endless night to lie before I break the plighted faith I gave. No, he who had my vows shall ever have, for whom I loved on earth I worship in the grave. She said, the tears ran gushing from her eyes and stopped her speech. Her sister thus replies, Oh, dearer than the vital air I breathe, Will you to grief your blooming years bequeath, Condemned to waste in woes your lonely life Without the joys of mother or of wife? Think you these tears, this pompous train of woe, Are known or valued by the ghosts below? I grant that, while your sorrows yet were green, It well became a woman and a queen the vows of Tyrian princes to neglect, to scorn Hyarbas and his love reject with all the Libyan lords of mighty name. But will you fight against a pleasing flame? This little spot of land which heaven bestows on every side is hemmed with warlike foes. Gaetulian cities here are spread around, and fierce Numidians there your frontiers bound. Here lies a barren waste of thirsty land, and there the Surtes raise the moving sand. Barcaean troops besiege the narrow shore, and from the sea Pygmalion threatens more. Propitious heaven and gracious Juno, lead this wandering navy to your needful aid. 
How will your empire spread, your city rise from such a union, and with such allies? Implore the favour of the powers above, and leave the conduct of the rest to love. Continue still your hospitable way, and still invent occasions of their stay, till storms and winter winds shall cease to threat, and planks and oars repair their shattered fleet. These words, which from a friend and sister came, with ease resolved the scruples of her fame, and added fury to the kindled flame. Inspired with hope the project they pursue, on every altar sacrifice renew. A chosen ewe of two years old they pay to Ceres, Bacchus, and the god of day, preferring Juno's power, for Juno ties the nuptial knot and makes the marriage joys. The beauteous queen before her altar stands, and holds the golden goblet in her hands. A milk-white heifer she with flowers adorns, and pours the ruddy wine betwixt her horns. And while the priests with prayer the gods invoke, she feeds their altars with Sabaean smoke. With hourly care the sacrifice renews, and anxiously the panting entrails views. What priestly rites, alas, what pious art, what vows avail to cure a bleeding heart? A gentle fire she feeds within her veins, where the soft god secure in silence reigns. Sick with desire, and seeking him she loves, from street to street the raving Dido roves. So when the watchful shepherd from the blind wounds with a random shaft the careless hind, Distracted with her pain, she flies the woods, bounds o'er the lawn, and seeks the silent floods, with fruitless care, for still the fatal dart sticks in her side and rankles in her heart. And now she leads the Trojan chief along the lofty walls, amidst the busy throng, displays her Tyrian wealth and rising town, which love without his labour makes his own. This pomp she shows to tempt her wandering guest. Her faltering tongue forbids to speak the rest. When day declines, and feasts renew the night, Still on his face she feeds her famished sight. She longs again to hear the prince relate His own adventures and the Trojan fate. He tells it o'er and o'er, but still in vain, For still she begs to hear it once again. The hearer on the speaker's mouth depends, and thus the tragic story never ends. Then, when they part, when Phoebe's paler light withdraws, and falling stars to sleep invite, she last remains, when every guest is gone, sits on the bed he pressed, and sighs alone. Absent, her absent hero sees and hears, or in her bosom young Ascanius bears, and seeks the father's image in the child, if love by likeness might be so beguiled. Meantime the rising towers are at a stand. No labours exercise the youthful band, nor use of arts, nor toils of arms they know. The mole is left unfinished to the foe. The mounds, the works, the walls neglected lie short of their promised height that seemed to threat the sky. But when imperial Juno from above saw Dido fettered in the chains of love, Hot with the venom which her veins inflamed, And by no sense of shame to be reclaimed, With soothing words to Venus she begun. High praises, endless honours you have won, And mighty trophies with your worthy son. Two gods a silly woman have undone. Nor am I ignorant, you both suspect This rising city which my hands erect, but shall celestial discord never cease? Tis better ended in a lasting peace. You stand possessed of all your soul desired. Poor Dido with consuming love is fired. Your Trojan with my Tyrian let us join. So Dido shall be yours, Aeneas mine. One common kingdom, one united line, Eliza shall a Dardan lord obey, And lofty Carthage for a dower convey. Then Venus, who her hidden fraud descried, Which would the sceptre of the world misguide To Libyan shores, thus artfully replied, 
Who but a fool would wars with Juno choose, And such alliance and such gifts refuse, If fortune with our joint desires comply? The doubt is all from Jove and destiny, Lest he forbid with absolute command To mix the people in one common land. Or will the Trojan and the Tyrian line In lasting leagues and sure succession join? But you, the partner of his bed and throne, May move his mind. My wishes are your own. Mine, said imperial Juno, be the care. Time urges now to perfect this affair. Attend my counsel and the secret share. When next the sun his rising light displays And gilds the world below with purple rays, The queen, Aeneas, and the Tyrian court Shall to the shady woods for sylvan game resort. There, while the huntsmen pitch their toils around, And cheerful horns from side to side resound, A pitchy cloud shall cover all the plain, With hail and thunder and tempestuous rain. The fearful train shall take their speedy flight, Dispersed and all involved in gloomy night. One cave a grateful shelter shall afford To the fair princess and the Trojan lord. I will myself the bridal bed prepare, If you to bless the nuptials will be there. So shall their loves be crowned with due delights, And Hymen shall be present at the rites. The queen of love consents, and closely smiles at her vain project and discovered wiles. The rosy morn was risen from the main, and horns and hounds awake the princely train. They issue early through the city gate, where the more wakeful huntsmen ready wait, with nets and toils and darts, beside the force of Spartan dogs and swift Massilian horse. The Tyrian peers and officers of state for the slow queen in antechambers wait, her lofty courser in the court below, who his majestic rider seems to know, proud of his purple trappings, paws the ground, and champs the golden bit and spreads the foam around. The queen at length appears. On either hand the brawny guards in martial order stand. A flowered simmer with golden fringe she wore, and at her back a golden quiver bore. Her flowing hair a golden call restrains, a golden clasp the Tyrian robe sustains. Then young Ascanius, with a sprightly grace, leads on the Trojan youth to view the chase. But far above the rest in beauty shines the great Aeneas. The troop he joins, like fair Apollo, when he leaves the frost of wintry Xanthus and the Lycian coast, when to his native Delos he resorts, ordains the dances and renews the sports, where painted Scythians, mixed with Cretan bands, before the joyful altars join their hands, himself, on Synthus walking, sees below the merry madness of the sacred show. Green wreaths of bays his length of hair enclose, a golden fillet binds his awful brows. His quiver sounds, not less the prince is seen in manly presence or in lofty mien. Now had they reached the hills, and stormed the seat of savage beasts, in dens, their last retreat. The cry pursues the mountain goats, they bound from rock to rock and keep the craggy ground. Quite otherwise the stags, a trembling train, in herds unsingled scour the dusty plain, and a long chase in open view maintain. The glad Ascanius, as his courser guides, spurs through the vale, and these and those outrides. His horse's flanks and sides are forced to feel the clanking lash and goring of the steel. Impatiently he views the feeble prey, wishing some nobler beast to cross his way, and rather would the tusky boar attend, or see the tawny lion downward bend. Meantime the gathering clouds obscure the skies. From pole to pole the forky lightning flies. The rattling thunders roll, and Juno pours a wintry deluge down, and sounding showers. The company disperse to covert's ride, and seek the homely cots or mountain's hollow side. The rapid rains, descending from the hills, to rolling torrents raise the creeping rills. The queen and prince, as love or fortune guides, one common cavern in her bosom hides. 
Then first the trembling earth the signal gave, And flashing fires enlighten all the cave. Hell from below, and Juno from above, And howling nymphs were conscious of their love. From this ill-omened hour in time arose debate and death, and all succeeding woes. The queen, whom sense of honour could not move, no longer made a secret of her love, but called it marriage, by that specious name to veil the crime and sanctify the shame. The loud report through Libyan cities goes, fame, the great ill, from small beginnings grows. Swift from the first, and every moment brings new vigour to her flights, new pinions to her wings. Soon grows the pygmy to gigantic size, her feet on earth, her forehead in the skies. Enraged against the gods, revengeful earth produced her last of the Titanian birth. Swift is her walk, more swift her winged haste, a monstrous phantom, horrible and vast. As many plumes as raise her lofty flight, so many piercing eyes enlarge her sight. Millions of opening mouths to fame belong, and every mouth is furnished with a tongue, and round with listening ears the flying plague is hung. She fills the peaceful universe with cries, no slumbers ever close her wakeful eyes. By day from lofty towers her head she shows, and spreads through trembling crowds disastrous news, with court informers' haunts and royal spies. Things done relates, not done she feigns, and mingles truth with lies. Talk is her business, and her chief delight to tell of prodigies and cause a fright. She fills the people's ears with Dido's name, who, lost to honour and the sense of shame, admits into her throne and nuptial bed a wandering guest, who from his country fled whole days with him she passes in delights, and wastes in luxury long winter nights, forgetful of her fame and royal trust, dissolved in ease, abandoned to her lust. The goddess widely spreads the loud report, and flies at length to King Hyabas' court, when first possessed with this unwelcome news, whom did he not of men and gods accuse? This prince, from ravished Garamantis born, a hundred temples did with spoils adorn in Ammon's honour, his celestial sire, a hundred altars fed with wakeful fire, and through his vast dominions priests ordained whose watchful care these holy rites maintained. The gates and columns were with garlands crowned, and blood of victim beasts enriched the ground. He, when he heard a fugitive could move the Tyrian princess who disdained his love, his breast with fury burned, his eyes with fire, mad with despair, impatient with desire. Then on the sacred altars pouring wine, he thus with prayers implored his sire divine. Great Jove, propitious to the Moorish race, who feast on painted beds, with offerings grace thy temples, and adore thy power divine with blood of victims and with sparkling wine, cease thou not this, or do we fear in vain thy boasted thunder and thy thoughtless reign? Do thy broad hands the forky lightnings lance? Thine are the bolts or the blind work of chance. A wandering woman builds within our state a little town bought at an easy rate, she pays me homage, and my grants allow a narrow space of Libyan lands to plough. Yet, scorning me, by passion blindly led, admits a banished Trojan to her bed. And now this other Paris, with his train of conquered cowards, must in Afric reign, whom what they are their looks and garbs confess, their locks with oil perfume, their Lydian dress. He takes the spoil, enjoys the princely dame, and I, rejected I, adore an empty name. His vows in haughty terms he thus preferred, and held his altar's horns. The mighty thunderer heard, then cast his eyes on Carthage, where he found the lustful pair in lawless pleasure drowned. Lost in their loves, insensible of shame, and both forgetful of their better fame. 
He calls Silenius, and the god attends, By whom his menacing command he sends. Go, mount the western winds and cleave the sky, Then with a swift descent to Carthage fly. There find the Trojan chief who wastes his days In slothful riot and inglorious ease, Nor minds the future city given by fate. To him this message from my mouth relate. Not so fair Venus hoped when twice she won thy life with prayers, nor promised such a son. Hers was a hero, destined to command a martial race and rule the Latian land. Who should his ancient line from Teusa draw and on the conquered world impose the law? If glory cannot move a mind so mean, nor future praise from fading pleasure wean, Yet why should he defraud his son of fame, And grudge the Romans their immortal name? What are his vain designs? What hopes he more from his long lingering on a hostile shore, Regardless to redeem his honour lost, And for his race to gain the Ausonian coast? Bid him with speed the Tyrian court forsake, With this command the slumbering warrior wake. Hermes obeys. With golden pinions binds his flying feet and mounts the western winds. And whether o'er the seas or earth he flies, with rapid force they bear him down the skies. But first he grasps within his awful hand that mark of sovereign power, his magic wand. With this he draws the ghosts from hollow graves, with this he drives them down the Stygian waves. With this he seals in sleep the wakeful sight, and eyes, though closed in death, restores to light. Thus armed, the god begins his airy race, and drives the racking clouds along the liquid space. Now sees the tops of Atlas as he flies, whose brawny back supports the starry skies. Atlas, whose head with piney forests crowned, is beaten by the winds, with foggy vapours bound. Snows hide his shoulders. From beneath his chin the founts of rolling streams their race begin, a beard of ice on his large breast depends. Here, poised upon his wings, the god descends. Then rested thus he from the towering height, Plunged downward with precipitated flight, Lights on the seas, and skims along the flood, As waterfowl who seek their fishy food, Less and yet less to distant prospect show. By turns they dance aloft and dive below. Like these, the steerage of his wings he plies, and near the surface of the water flies, till, having passed the seas and crossed the sands, he closed his wings and stooped on Libyan lands, where shepherds once were housed in homely sheds, now towers within the clouds advance their heads. Arriving there, he found the Trojan prince new ramparts raising for the town's defence, a purple scarf with gold embroidered o'er, Queen Dido's gift, about his waist he wore. A sword, with glittering gems diversified, For ornament, not use, hung idly by his side. Then thus, with winged words, the god began, Resuming his own shape. Degenerate man! Thou woman's property, what makes thou here, These foreign walls and Tyrian towers to rear, Forgetful of thy own? All-powerful Jove, who sways the world below and heaven above, Has sent me down with this severe command. What means thy lingering in the Libyan land? If glory cannot move a mind so mean, Nor future praise from flitting pleasure wean, Regard the fortunes of thy rising heir. The promised crown let young Ascanius wear, To whom the Ausonian sceptre and the state Of Rome's imperial name is owed by fate. So spoke the god, and speaking took his flight, Involved in clouds and vanished out of sight. The pious prince was seized with sudden fear. Mute was his tongue and upright stood his hair. Revolving in his mind the stern command, He longs to fly and loathes the charming land. What should he say? Or how should he begin? What course, alas, remains to steer Between the offended lover and the powerful queen? 
This way and that he turns his anxious mind, and all expedients tries, and none can find. Fixed on the deed, but doubtful of the means, after long thought to this advice he leans. Three chiefs he calls, commands them to repair the fleet and ship their men with silent care. Some plausible pretense he bids them find to colour what in secret he designed. Himself, meantime, the softest hours would choose before the lovesick lady heard the news, and move her tender mind by slow degrees to suffer what the sovereign power decrees. Jove will inspire him when and what to say. They hear with pleasure and with haste obey. But soon the queen perceives the thin disguise. What arts can blind a jealous woman's eyes? She was the first to find the secret fraud, before the fatal news was blazed abroad. Love the first motions of the lover hears, quick to presage and even in safety fears. Nor impious fame was wanting to report the ships repaired, the Trojans' thick resort and purpose to forsake the Tyrian court. Frantic with fear, impatient of the wound, and impotent of mind, she roves the city round. Less wild the Bacchanalian dames appear, when from afar their nightly god they hear, and howl about the hills and shake the wreathy spear. At length she finds the dear perfidious man, prevents his formed excuse, and thus began. Base and ungrateful! Could you hope to fly and undiscovered scape a lover's eye? Nor could my kindness your compassion move, nor plighted vows, nor dearer bands of love. Or is the death of a despairing queen not worth preventing, though too well foreseen? Even when the wintry winds command your stay, you dare the tempests and defy the sea. False as you are, suppose you were not bound to lands unknown and foreign coasts to sound. Were Troy restored and Priam's happy reign, now durst you tempt for Troy the raging main? See whom you fly! Am I the foe you shun? Now, by those holy vows so late begun, by this right hand, since I have nothing more to challenge but the faith you gave before, I beg you, by these tears too truly shed, by the new pleasures of our nuptial bed, if ever Dido, when you most were kind, was pleasing in your eyes or touched your mind, by these my prayers, if prayers may yet have place, pity the fortunes of a falling race. For you I have provoked a tyrant's hate, incensed the Libyan and the Tyrian state. For you alone I suffer in my fame, bereft of honour and exposed to shame. Whom have I now to trust, ungrateful guest? That only name remains of all the rest. What have I left, or whither can I fly? Must I attend Pygmalion's cruelty, or till Iabas shall in triumph lead a queen that proudly scorned his proffered bed? Had you deferred at least your hasty flight, and left behind some pledge of our delight, some babe to bless the mother's mournful sight, some young Aeneas to supply your place, whose features might express his father's face, I should not then complain to live bereft of all my husband, or be wholly left. End of Book Four, Part One. Book Four, Part Two of the Aeneid. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book Four, The Passion of the Queen, Part Two. Here paused the Queen. Unmoved he holds his eyes by Jove's command, nor suffered love to rise, though heaving in his heart, and thus at length replies, Fair queen, you never can enough repeat your boundless favours, or I own my debt, nor can my mind forget Eliza's name, while vital breath inspires this mortal frame. This only let me speak in my defence, 
I never hoped a secret flight from hence, much less pretended to the lawful claim of sacred nuptials or a husband's name. For if indulgent heaven would leave me free and not submit my life to fate's decree, my choice would lead me to the Trojan shore, those relics to review, their dust adore, and Priam's ruined palace to restore. But now the Delphian oracle commands, and fate invites me to the Latian lands. That is the promised place to which I steer, and all my vows are terminated there. If you, a Tyrian and a stranger born, with walls and towers a Libyan town adorn, why may not we, like you a foreign race, like you seek shelter in a foreign place? As often as the night obscures the skies with humid shades, or twinkling stars arise, Anchises' angry ghost in dreams appears, chides my delay, and fills my soul with fears. And young Ascanius justly may complain, defrauded of his fate and destined reign. Even now the herald of the gods appeared, waking I saw him and his message heard, from Jove he came, commissioned heavenly bright, with radiant beams, and manifest to sight, the sender and the scent I both attest. These walls he entered, and those words expressed. Fair queen, oppose not what the gods command. Forced by my fate, I leave your happy land. Thus while he spoke, already she began with sparkling eyes to view the guilty man. From head to foot surveyed his person o'er, Nor longer these outrageous threats forbore. False as thou art, and more than false, forsworn, Not sprung from noble blood, nor goddess-born, But hewn from hardened entrails of a rock, And rough Hyrcanian tigers gave thee suck. Why should I fawn? What have I worse to fear? Did he once look, or lent a listening ear, Sighed when I sobbed or shed one kindly tear. All symptoms of a base, ungrateful mind, So foul that, which is worse, tis hard to find. Of man's injustice, why should I complain? The gods and Jove himself behold in vain Triumphant treason, yet no thunder flies, Nor Juno views my wrongs with equal eyes. Faithless is earth, and faithless are the skies. Justice is fled, and truth is now no more. I saved the shipwrecked exile on my shore, With needful food his hungry Trojans fed. I took the traitor to my throne and bed. Fool that I was, tis little to repeat the rest, I stored and rigged his ruined fleet. I rave, I rave. A god's command, he pleads, and makes heaven accessory to his deeds. Now Lycian Lot, and now the Delian god, now Hermes is employed from Jove's abode to warn him hence, as if the peaceful state of heavenly powers were touched with human fate. But go, thy flight no longer I detain. Go, seek thy promised kingdom through the main. Yet, if the heavens will hear my pious vow, the faithless waves, not half so false as thou, or secret sands shall sepulchres afford to thy proud vessels and their perjured lord. Then shalt thou call on injured Dido's name. Dido shall come in a black sulphury flame when death has once dissolved her mortal frame, shall smile to see the traitor vainly weep. Her angry ghost, arising from the deep, Shall haunt thee waking, and disturb thy sleep. At least my shade thy punishment shall know, And fame shall spread the pleasing news below. Abruptly here she stops, Then turns away her loathing eyes, And shuns the sight of day. Amazed he stood, revolving in his mind What speech to frame, and what excuse to find. Her fearful maids their fainting mistress led, And softly laid her on her ivory bed. But good Aeneas, though he much desired To give that pity which her grief required, Though much he mourned and laboured with his love, Resolved at length, obeys the will of Jove, Reviews his forces, they with early care Unmoor their vessels and for sea prepare, 
The fleet is soon afloat in all its pride, And well-colked galleys in the harbour ride. Then oaks for oars they felled, or, as they stood, Of its green arms despoiled the growing wood, Studious of flight. The beach is covered o'er with Trojan bands That blacken all the shore. On every side are seen, descending down, Thick swarms of soldiers loaden from the town. Thus in battalia march embodied ants, Fearful of winter and of future wants, To invade the corn and to their cells convey The plundered forage of their yellow prey. The sable troops along the narrow tracks Scarce bear the weighty burthen on their backs. Some set their shoulders to the ponderous grain, Some guard the spoil, some lash the lagging train. All ply their several tasks, and equal toil sustain. What pangs the tender breast of Dido bore, When from the tower she saw the covered shore, And heard the shouts of sailors from afar Mixed with the murmurs of the watery war. All-powerful love, what changes canst thou cause In human hearts subjected to thy laws? Once more her haughty soul the tyrant bends, To prayers and mean submission she descends. No female arts or age she left untried, Nor counsels unexplored, before she died. Look, Anna, look, the Trojans crowd to sea, They spread their canvas and their anchors way. The shouting crew their ships with garlands bind, Invoke the sea-gods and invite the wind. Could I have thought this threatening blow so near, My tender soul had been forewarned to bear. But do not you my last request deny, With yon perfidious man your interest try, And bring me news, if I must live or die. You are his favourite, you alone can find The dark recesses of his inmost mind. In all his trusted secrets you have part, And know the soft approaches to his heart. Haste, then, and humbly seek my haughty foe. Tell him, I did not with the Grecians go, Nor did my fleet against his friends employ, Nor swore the ruin of unhappy Troy, Nor moved with hands profane his father's dust. Why should he then reject a suit so just? Whom does he shun, and whither would he fly? Can he this last, this only prayer deny? Let him at least his dangerous flight delay, Wait better winds, and hope a calmer sea. The nuptials, he disclaims, I urge no more. Let him pursue the promised Latian shore. A short delay is all I ask him now, A pause of grief, an interval from woe, Till my soft soul be tempered to sustain Accustomed sorrows and inured to pain. If you in pity grant this one request, My death shall glut the hatred of his breast. This mournful message pious Anna bears, And seconds with her own her sister's tears. But all her arts are still employed in vain. Again she comes, and is refused again. His hardened heart nor prayers nor threatenings move. Fate and the God had stopped his ears to love. As when the winds their airy quarrel try, Jostling from every quarter of the sky, This way and that the mountain oak they bend, His boughs they shatter and his branches rend, With leaves and falling mast they spread the ground, The hollow valleys echo to the sound. Unmoved the royal plant their fury mocks, Or, shaken, clings more closely to the rocks, For as he shoots his towering head on high, so deep in earth his fixed foundations lie. No less a storm the Trojan hero bears. Thick messages and loud complaints he hears, And bandied words still beating on his ears. Sighs, groans, and tears proclaim his inward pains, But the firm purpose of his heart remains. The wretched queen, pursued by cruel fate, Begins at length the light of heaven to hate, And loathes to live. Then dire portents she sees, To hasten on the death her soul decrees. Strange to relate, For when, before the shrine, She pours in sacrifice the purple wine, The purple wine is turned to putrid blood, And the white offered milk converts to mud. 
This dire presage to her alone revealed, From all, and even her sister, she concealed. A marble temple stood within the grove, Sacred to death and to her murdered love. That honoured chapel she had hung around With snowy fleeces and with garlands crowned. Oft, when she visited this lonely dome, Strange voices issued from her husband's tomb. She thought she heard him summon her away, Invite her to his grave and chide her stay. Hourly tis heard, when with a boding note The solitary screech-owl strains her throat, And on a chimney's top or turret's height With songs obscene disturbs the silence of the night. Besides, old prophecies augment her fears, And stern Aeneas in her dreams appears, Disdainful as by day, she seems alone to wander in her sleep through ways unknown, guideless and dark, or in a desert plain to seek her subjects and to seek in vain. Like Pentheus, when distracted with his fear, he saw two sons and double Thebes appear, or mad Orestes, when his mother's ghost full in his face infernal torches tossed and shook her snaky locks, he shuns the sight, flies o'er the stage, surprised with mortal fright. The furies guard the door and intercept his flight. Now, sinking underneath a load of grief, from death alone she seeks her last relief. The time and means resolved within her breast, she to her mournful sister thus addressed, dissembling hope, her cloudy front she clears, and a false vigour in her eyes appears. Rejoice, she said, instructed from above, my lover I shall gain or lose my love. Nigh rising Atlas, next the falling sun, long tracts of Ethiopian climates run. There a Massilian priestess I have found, honoured for age, for magic arts renowned. The Hesperian temple was her trusted care, twas she supplied the wakeful dragon's fare. She poppy seeds in honey taught to steep, Reclaimed his rage, and soothed him into sleep. She watched the golden fruit. Her charms unbind the chains of love, or fix them on the mind. She stops the torrents, leaves the channel dry, Repels the stars, and backwards bears the sky. The yawning earth rebellows to her call, Pale ghosts ascend, and mountain ashes fall. Witness, ye gods, and thou my better part, how loath I am to try this impious art! Within the secret court, with silent care, Erect a lofty pile, exposed in air, Hang on the topmost part the Trojan vest, Spoils, arms, and presents of my faithless guest. Next, under those, the bridal bed be placed, Where I my ruin in his arms embraced. All relics of the wretch are doomed to fire, for so the priestess and her charms require. Thus far she said, and farther speech forbears. A mortal paleness in her face appears. Yet the mistrustless Anna could not find the secret funeral in these rites designed, nor thought so dire a rage possessed her mind. Unknowing of a train concealed so well, she feared no worse than when Sichaeus fell, therefore obeys. The fatal pile they rear within the secret court, exposed in air. The cloven holms and pines are heaped on high, and garlands on the hollow spaces lie. Sad cypress, vervain, yew compose the wreath, and every baleful green denoting death. The queen, determined to the fatal deed, the spoils and sword he left in order spread, and the man's image on the nuptial bed. And now, the sacred altars placed around, the priestess enters, with her hair unbound, and thrice invokes the powers below the ground, night, Erebus, and chaos, she proclaims, and threefold Hecate with her hundred names, and three Dianas. Next she sprinkles round with feigned Avernian drops the hallowed ground, culls hoary simples found by Phoebe's light with brazen sickles reaped at noon of night, then mixes baleful juices in the bowl, and cuts the forehead of a new-born foal, robbing the mother's love. The destined queen observes, 
assisting at the rites obscene. A leavened cake in her devoted hands she holds, and next the highest altar stands. One tender foot was shod, the other bare. Girt was her gathered gown, and loose her hair. Thus dressed, she summoned with her dying breath the heavens and planets conscious of her death, and every power, if any rules above, who minds or who revenges injured love. T'was dead of night, when weary bodies close their eyes in balmy sleep and soft repose. The winds no longer whisper through the woods, nor murmuring tides disturb the gentle floods. The stars in silent order moved around, and peace with downy wings was brooding on the ground. The flocks and herds and party-coloured fowl which haunt the woods or swim the weedy pool, stretched on the quiet earth, securely lay, forgetting the past labours of the day. All else of nature's common gift partake. Unhappy Dido was alone awake. Nor sleep nor ease the furious queen can find. Sleep fled her eyes as quiet fled her mind. Despair and rage and love divide her heart. Despair and rage had some, but love the greater part. Then thus she said within her secret mind, What shall I do, what succour can I find? Become a suppliant to Yaba's pride, And take my turn to court and be denied? Shall I with this ungrateful Trojan go, Forsake an empire and a tender foe? Himself I refuged, and his train relieved, tis true, but am I sure to be received? Can gratitude in Trojan souls have place? Laomedon still lives in all his race. Or shall I seek alone the churlish crew, or with my fleet their flying sails pursue? What force have I but those whom scarce before I drew reluctant from their native shore? Will they again embark at my desire, once more sustain the seas, and quit their second tire? Rather with steel thy guilty breast invade, and take the fortune thou thyself hast made. Your pity, sister, first seduced my mind, or seconded too well what I designed. These dear-bought pleasures had I never known, had I continued free and still my own, avoiding love, I had not found despair, but shared with savage beasts the common air, like them, a lonely life I might have led, not mourned the living, nor disturbed the dead. These thoughts she brooded in her anxious breast. On board the Trojan found more easy rest. Resolved to sail, in sleep he passed the night, and ordered all things for his early flight. To whom once more the winged god appears, his former youthful mien and shape he wears, and with this new alarm invades his ears. Sleep'st thou, O goddess born, and canst thou drown thy needful cares so near a hostile town, beset with foes? Nor hears the western gales invite thy passage and inspire thy sails? She harbours in her heart a furious hate, and thou shalt find the dire effects too late. Fixed on revenge and obstinate to die, Haste swiftly hence whilst thou hast power to fly. The sea with ships will soon be covered o'er, And blazing firebrands kindle all the shore. Prevent her rage while night obscures the skies, And sail before the purple morn arise. Who knows what hazards thy delay may bring? Woman's a various and a changeful thing. Thus Hermes in the dream, then took his flight aloft in air unseen and mixed with night. Twice warned by the celestial messenger, the pious prince arose with hasty fear, then roused his drowsy train without delay. Haste to your banks, your crooked anchor's way, and spread your flying sails and stand to sea. A god commands. He stood before my sight and urged us once again to speedy flight. O oh, sacred power, what power soe'er thou art, to thy blessed orders I resign my heart. Lead thou the way, protect thy Trojan bands, and prosper the design thy will commands. He said, and drawing forth his flaming sword, his thundering arm divides the many-twisted cord. A 
An emulating zeal inspires his train. They run, they snatch, they rush into the main. With headlong haste they leave the desert shores and brush the liquid seas with labouring oars. Aurora now had left her saffron bed, and beams of early light the heavens o'erspread, when from a tower the queen with wakeful eyes saw day point upward from the rosy skies. She looked to seaward, but the sea was void, and scarce in ken the sailing ships descried. Stung with despite and furious with despair, she struck her trembling breast and tore her hair. "'And shall the ungrateful traitor go?' she said, "'my land forsaken and my love betrayed. "'Shall we not arm, not rush from every street, "'to follow, sink, and burn his perjured fleet? "'Haste, haul my galleys out, pursue the foe, "'bring flaming brand, set sail, and swiftly row. "'What have I said? Where am I? "'Fury turns my brain, and my distempered bosom burns.' Then, when I gave my person and my throne, This hate, this rage, had been more timely shown. See now the promised faith, the vaunted name, The pious man who, rushing through the flame, Preserved his gods, and to the Phrygian shore The burthen of his feeble father bore. I should have torn him piecemeal, Strode in floods his scattered limbs, Or left exposed in woods, Destroyed his friends and son, and from the fire Have set the reeking boy before the sire. Events are doubtful which on battles wait, Yet where's the doubt to souls secure of fate? My Tyrians at their injured queen's command Had tossed their fires amid the Trojan band, At once extinguished all the faithless name, And I myself, in vengeance of my shame, Had fallen upon the pile to mend the funeral flame. Thou son, who viewst at once the world below, Thou Juno, guardian of the nuptial vow, Thou Hecate, hearken from thy dark abodes, Ye furies, fiends, and violated gods, All powers invoked with Dido's dying breath, Attend her curses, and avenge her death. If so the fates ordain, and Jove commands, The ungrateful wretch should find the Latian lands, Yet let a race untamed and haughty foes His peaceful entrance with dire arms oppose. Oppressed with numbers in the unequal field, His men discouraged and himself expelled, Let him for succour sue from place to place, Torn from his subject and his son's embrace. First let him see his friends in battle slain, And their untimely fate lament in vain. And when at length the cruel war shall cease, On hard conditions may he buy his peace. Nor let them then enjoy supreme command, But fall untimely by some hostile hand, And lie unburied on the barren sand. These are my prayers, and this my dying will, And you, my Tyrians, every curse fulfil. Perpetual hate and mortal wars proclaim Against the prince, the people, and the name. These grateful offerings on my grave bestow, Nor league nor love the hostile nations know. Now and from hence, in every future age, When rage excites your arms and strength supplies the rage, Rise some avenger of our Libyan blood, With fire and sword pursue the perjured brood. Our arms, our seas, our shores opposed to theirs, And the same hate descend on all our heirs. This said, within her anxious mind, She weighs the means of cutting short her odious days. Then to Sicaeus' nurse she briefly said, For when she left her country hers was dead, Go, Barke, call my sister. Let her care the solemn rites of sacrifice prepare, The sheep and all the atoning offerings bring. Sprinkling her body from the crystal spring with living drops, Then let her come, and thou with sacred fillets bind thy hoary brow. Thus will I pay my vows to Stygian Jove, And end the cares of my disastrous love. Then cast the Trojan image on the fire, And as that burns my passions shall expire. The nurse moves onward, with officious care, And all the speed her aged limbs can bear. 
But furious Dido, with dark thoughts involved, Shook at the mighty mischief she resolved. With livid spots distinguished was her face, Red were her rolling eyes, and discomposed her pace. Ghastly she gazed, with pain she drew her breath, And nature shivered at approaching death. Then swiftly to the fatal place she passed, And mounts the funeral pile with furious haste, Unsheathed the sword the Trojan left behind, Not for so dire an enterprise designed. But when she viewed the garments loosely spread Which once he wore, and saw the conscious bed, She paused, and with a sigh the robes embraced. Then on the couch her trembling body cast, Repressed the ready tears, and spoke her last. Dear pledges of my love, while heaven so pleased, Receive a soul of mortal anguish eased. My fatal course is finished, and I go, A glorious name, among the ghosts below. A lofty city by my hands is raised, Pygmalion punished, and my lord appeased. What could my fortune have afforded more, Had the false Trojan never touched my shore? Then kissed the couch, and... Must I die, she said, and unrevenged, Tis doubly to be dead. Yet even this death with pleasure I receive, On any terms, tis better than to live. These flames from far may the false Trojan view, These boding omens his base flight pursue. She said, and struck. Deep entered in her side the piercing steel, with reeking purple dyed, Clogged in the wound the cruel weapon stands, The spouting blood came streaming on her hands. Her sad attendant saw the deadly stroke, And with loud cries the sounding palace shook. Distracted from the fatal sight they fled, And through the town the dismal rumour spread. First from the frighted court the yell began, Redoubled thence from house to house it ran, the groans of men with shrieks, laments, and cries of mixing women mount the vaulted skies. Not less the clamour than if ancient Tyre or the new Carthage set by foes on fire, the rolling ruin with their loved abodes involved the blazing temples of their gods. Her sister hears, and furious with despair, she beats her breast and rends her yellow hair and calling on Eliza's name aloud, runs breathless to the place, and breaks the crowd. Was all that pomp of woe for this prepared? These fires, this funeral pile, these altars reared? Was all this train of plots contrived, said she, all only to deceive unhappy me? Which is the worst? Didst thou in death pretend to scorn thy sister, or delude thy friend? Thy summoned sister and thy friend had come. One sword had served us both, one common tomb. Was I to raise the pile the powers invoke, not to be present at the fatal stroke? At once thou hast destroyed thyself and me, thy town, thy senate, and thy colony. Bring water, bathe the wound, while I in death lay close my lips to hers and catch the flying breath. This said, she mounts the pile with eager haste, and in her arms the gasping queen embraced. Her temples chafed, and her own garments tore to staunch the streaming blood and cleanse the gore. Thrice Dido tried to raise her drooping head, and fainting thrice fell grovelling on the bed. Thrice oped her heavy eyes and sought the light, But having found it, sickened at the sight, And closed her lids at last in endless night. Then Juno, grieving that she should sustain A death so lingering and so full of pain, Sent Iris down to free her from the strife Of labouring nature and dissolve her life. For since she died, not doomed by heaven's decree, of her own crime, but human casualty and rage of love that plunged her in despair, 
The sisters had not cut the topmost hair which Proserpine and they can only know, nor made her sacred to the shades below. Downward the various goddess took her flight, and drew a thousand colours from the light, then stood above the dying lover's head, and said, I thus devote thee to the dead. This offering to the infernal gods I bear. Thus while she spoke, she cut the fatal hair. The struggling soul was loosed, and life dissolved in air. End of Book Four